Tonight we return to 1 Corinthians 13, and we make blazing progress by going on to the next verse, <laughs> verse 5. Love does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered. Let's pray and ask God's blessing. Lord, thank you for these densely packed verses of 1 Corinthians. We thank you that Paul, by your Spirit, recorded them, that the Spirit has preserved them, and that through the ages they have come down to us, the authoritative Word of God. Bless now this Word and help us to live according to it. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. With the recent seating of our new Congress, it has become apparent that things have changed in our political world. And I'm not really talking about the shift from Republican control of the House to that of the Democrats, but rather I'm talking about basic rules of decency. The first indication came from newly elected Representative Rashida Tlaib, a Muslim woman from Michigan. After being sworn in, she was at a rally and she made a very publicized, extremely crude statement about the president, Donald Trump, calling him a name that is frankly unrepeatable. When the media questioned her, she didn't back down, but continued to characterize the president in that vulgar way. It was interesting that President Trump tweeted out that Tlaib had dishonored her family by the language she had chosen to use. And then more recently, new Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the darling of the media, used the language of violent criminal sexual assault to describe the strategy of the far left wing of the Democratic Party towards more moderate Democrats and the Republicans. All of this is extremely shameful, especially for elected officials, those who used to be called our civil servants. And as such conduct becomes more common and more socially acceptable in the broader culture, we need the reminder that verse 5 gives us Love does not act unbecomingly. We are called to a higher standard, to a different approach to life. And as we focus on this tonight, I want to first consider that love is not shameful. Then we're going to look at love's wisdom and finally some thoughts on walking wisely in this world. The Greek verb that Paul chooses in this opening phrase of verse 5 is used only one other time in the New Testament, and it comes in 1 Corinthians. Back in chapter 7, verse 36, Paul writes, But if any man thinks he is acting unbecomingly toward his virgin daughter... And as we saw when we looked at that passage, the reference there is somewhat obscure and the meaning is not altogether obvious. Just to double check, I went back to my sermon manuscript when I preached on those verses in chapter 7. And what I did was to scratch my head because it is not at all clear. So we really don't have a lot of helpful cross-references of this verb to aid us in understanding the point Paul is making here. But that doesn't mean we're without any hope. The Greek language uses cognates, which are related words from the same root. 
So there is a cognate noun form, the noun form of this verb. There is also a cognate adjective, which is the adjectival form of this verb. Siempa and Rosner, in their commentary, deal with all of these various forms when they write, this verb means to act contrary to a standard of decency. That is, to behave disgracefully, dishonorably, indecently. The noun form means behavior that elicits disgrace. And the cognate adjective refers to something that is not openly done, displayed, or discussed in reserved society because it is considered shameful, unpresentable, indecent, or unmentionable. The actual Greek word has as its base the word schema, from which we get scheme. And then it has something at the beginning which is called an alpha privative, which denies what follows. So it is to be contrary to the scheme. It's to be against the scheme of the way things ought to be. One translator renders this phrase, love does not behave with ill-mannered impropriety. And I think that's a pretty good effort to capture the meaning. So the core concept here is to behave dishonorably, disgracefully, improperly, shamefully, or indecently indecently. Love is antithetical to those things. Love cannot conduct itself in a way that brings shame upon itself. The Christian who loves God cannot behave like this because it is contrary to God's revealed will. A believer's basic sense of morality and decency will not allow him to engage in such disgraceful activities. But instead, he will recoil from such conduct because he is committed to loving God first and loving his neighbor as himself. So he knows that he must take the high road and remain always above reproach. Now, you might hear that and say, well, but sometimes I struggle with things. Sometimes I'm tempted by things that are shameful or indecent or improper. Does that mean I'm not a Christian? No, but a Christian doesn't just blithely do such things and say, who cares? What does it matter? I kind of enjoy this shameful, indecent, inappropriate activity. If you're a Christian who struggles with such things, the very struggle itself is a sign that the Spirit of God is working in you, leading you to put off old bad habits and to put on righteousness. It's the people who could care less that really should question, am I a Christian? If I can engage in such conduct without any conscientious pangs without any difficulty at all. Well, where does such vile conduct come from? What is its source? By considering the context, commentator Lenski puts a finger on it when he writes this. When pride puffs up the heart, unseemly bearing and conduct naturally follow. Tactlessness forgets its own place and fails to accord to others their proper dues of respect, honor, or consideration. Now here Lenski is just going back to the end of verse 4, which talked about proud attitudes and arrogant speech. 
And Paul does seem to be moving from those problems of pride and boasting right into this unseemly behavior. And when pride is at work, people tend to forget themselves and do things that they later might regret. So when a person has an overinflated opinion of his own place, his own importance, when they think more highly of themselves than they should, they lose their equilibrium. And they begin saying and doing things that are embarrassing and shameful to them. Proverbs teaches us about this. In Proverbs 16, verse 18, we read, Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before stumbling. So as a man's head begins to swell, his brain ceases to work as it should. The internal governors that would curb his folly are thrown off, and he plows ahead in his stupidity. And he says things, and he does things that bring disgrace upon him. So the root of pride is connected into this problem. Well, in stark contrast is the wisdom of love. A wisdom that is marked by basic decency, propriety, good manners, and overall humility. Such love understands the difference between right and wrong, and it orders its behavior to match those unchanging norms. One of my mentors, Bebo Elkin, used to say, you never have the right to do what's wrong. There's never an explanation, a rationale, an excuse for doing what's wrong. That's just not your right. As a Christian, as a follower of Christ, you are always bound to do the right, the good, the true thing. This love perseveres and it endures. It is not constantly adjusting its sails to the changing winds of society. But there is a steadfast and unchangeable goodness to such love. Dr. Simon Kistemacher described it this way, a person who demonstrates love always strives for proper decorum in relation to others. Whether the people whom he meets occupy a high or a low position in society, whether they are friend or foe, the virtue of love is evident in his conduct. So this kind of person is always intent on approaching everyone properly appropriately, decently, fairly. And whether it is someone in a very high position or whether it is a very low position, it doesn't matter. This person is always trying to do the right thing, always trying to be appropriate, always trying to be loving and to have proper decorum. Now this is easy to do with our friends. We think that we like their friendship. We appreciate the love that they give back to us. And we don't want to be rude or obnoxious or disgraceful to our friends. But what about our enemies? That's a lot harder. To always behave with proper decorum toward an enemy, maybe a foe who is trying to provoke you, and yet, this kind of love has a maturity to it that says, I am not going to be baited into bad responses. I'm not going to be tricked or trapped by my enemy 
into making a disgraceful scene, I'm going to instead behave with that kind of calm, steady, steadfast maturity of love. Now there is a school of thought that is reflected in several of the commentaries that I consulted that suggests that this kind of love is merely adhering to social rules. These are man-made opinions about how people ought to act, and these rules, these opinions, are constantly changing. So what was deemed outrageous and inappropriate 30 years ago is broadly and uncritically accepted today. What might have seemed rude and shameful behavior to our grandparents might be fully acceptable, even virtuous, in our own day and age. And furthermore, according to this line of thought, what is deemed impolite in one culture might be viewed as perfectly acceptable in another culture. Well, I do not deny that there are many social rules that we all live under, or that expectations of society are constantly shifting, or even that there are different opinions in different cultures. I do object to the suggestion that this verse is counseling us to fit in and get along with current cultural expectations. Let me give you an example. The recent furor over Mike Pence's wife, Karen. Karen Pence is teaching part-time at a Christian school, and that Christian school requires that its faculty, staff, and students all abide by biblical standards of morality. And that fact has inflamed the left who accuse Mrs. Pence and the school of bigotry against transgender and homosexual persons. Well, if the moral revolution has established anything, it has enshrined the virtues of tolerance and acceptance of any and all sexual behaviors. In today's society, to reject gender fluidity or gay marriage is being deemed unbecoming, indecent, and shameful. And as society continues down this road of perversity, we are being forced to celebrate behaviors that the Bible condemns. So if we go with the view that this is just socially determined opinions, then we better get ready to march to the beat of that drummer. And we better be ready to celebrate things that the Bible clearly condemns. And this is why we simply cannot settle for the view that these are culturally determined rules of conduct. Paul is not saying, fit in with your society. Do what your next door neighbor does. That's not what he's telling us. He's telling us something more. Because love looks to the word of God for its cues on how to think, how to speak, how to act. And I believe that this is where the wisdom literature of Scripture is so helpful and so valuable. God gives us plenty of instruction in his word about what is good and right and wise behavior as well as showing us what is foolish, evil, and unwise conduct. And in the book of Proverbs, these things are often contrasted back to back, sometimes within the same verse. So if you have a Bible handy, turn to Proverbs chapter 12. I want to just give you an example. And if you think, well, he clearly chose the only chapter in Proverbs that fits the point, that's just not true. I could choose any chapter in Proverbs. I just opened up to chapter 12. I thought this is as good as anything. 
So Proverbs 12, starting at verse 10. A righteous man has regard for the life of his animal, but even the compassion of the wicked is cruel. He who tills his land will have plenty of bread, but he who pursues worthless things lacks sense. The wicked man desires the booty of evil men, but the root of the righteous yields fruit. An evil man is ensnared by the transgression of his lips, but the righteous will escape from trouble. A man who will be satisfied with good by the fruit of his words, and the deeds of a man's hands will return to him. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. A fool's anger is known at once, but a prudent man conceals dishonor. He who speaks truth tells what is right, but a false witness deceit. There is one who speaks rashly like the thrust of a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Truthful lips will be established forever, but a lying tongue is only for a moment. Deceit is in the heart of those who devise evil, but counselors of peace have joy. And it just goes on and on and on. It tells us how to talk. It tells us that if you will tell the truth, you're going to see prosperity come from that. But if you engage in deceitful speech, guess what? You're going to have trouble. It tells us about how to work. Be diligent. Do your work. Don't be lazy, because lazy people come to ruin. It even tells us how we should treat our animals. A righteous man is kind to his chickens, but the wicked man is cruel at everything. And so you go through the wisdom literature and you see, There's all of this intensely practical advice about how to live, how to speak, how to think, how to act. It's all there for us. And so we don't need to just fit in with our society as if we got into this life and there was no instruction book. The Bible gives us loads of information showing us how to live wisely how to be men and women of righteousness. So a faithful man looks to the word of God as his only rule for faith and life. He searches out its contents, studying and pondering over that word. And as his knowledge grows, the Lord grants him increased understanding. He is like a person with a puzzle. All of the pieces of the puzzle are laid out before him on the table, and as he slowly begins putting together the pieces of the puzzle, he begins to see the bigger picture. As his knowledge is growing and as his understanding is expanding, he begins to have more and more true wisdom. Wisdom takes from all of the information that has been gathered up in the storehouses of knowledge, and wisdom begins to apply that knowledge in the best possible ways. With understanding, the wise man knows what to do in all sorts of situations, because he is in the business of applying the truth that he believes in the life that he lives. This morning after Sunday school, Lynn and I were talking about her work at the hospital and how she has grown in wisdom over the years as a doctor. And as I was listening to her talk about her work as a doctor, I was thinking, yeah, that's me as a pastor too. When I was a a young, green, new pastor, I made lots of mistakes. And I did things, I look back now and I think, what were you thinking? (laughs) And, and, Through all kinds of experiences, the Lord gradually grew wisdom in me so that I can honestly and humbly say I'm a a better pastor today than I was 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago. There's progress being made because God brings wisdom over time. And sometimes that wisdom is learned 
in the hard school of failure. As we do things, and then we, we think, oh boy, that really was very bad, and that did not work well. We step back and we do a post-mortem. We examine why did that go as badly as it went. And the Lord grants us wisdom so that when we have similar situations in future days, we do better. We know more clearly how to apply the truth. Now this wisdom that is gained gradually through life translates into a sense of propriety and decency. The wise man behaves honorably, and he always treats others with respect. He is far more interested in the good of his fellow man and in the glory of God than he is in gaining a personal advantage for himself. Lenski says that such love is forgetful of self and thoughtful towards others. And so without much interest or attention to self, always focused on God and on others. And behaving towards God and behaving towards others with this wise sense of decency and propriety. Paul advises his young protege, Timothy, in this very area. He writes in 1 Timothy 3, I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long, but in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. So Paul's point to Timothy is, I'm trying to come to you. I want to be with you to help you in this. I want to give you some training and set an example before your eyes. But if I can't get there, I'm writing this letter so that you're going to know how to conduct yourself in the church. Because you need to know this. You need to be a wise pastor who conducts himself with decency and propriety in the church. Years ago, I was at a church event. This was back in Michigan. And we were setting up for a musical concert, and I was testing the microphone. And I was feeling lighthearted and kind of silly, and so I did some off-the-cuff singing into the microphone. And one of the elders there looked at me with a smile and said, never do that again. <laughs> I was like, ah. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll never do that again. And sometimes we need that for someone to say, you know, this is not appropriate. Don't do that again. Conduct yourself with propriety. Well, how does one put this all into practice? What are the practical ramifications of this kind of wise love? Kistemacher made a statement that I found helpful. He said, decent behavior does not stop with words or attitude. It also pertains to one's apparel and appearance. For love extends to all aspects of one's demeanor. And I thought about that. Love extends to all aspects of one's behavior. So let me give you three areas to think about in your life. First, how you talk. The words you use. What sort of language regularly comes out of your mouth? Do you find yourself speaking in coarse, rude, or offensive ways? Do you sometimes curse and swear? Are you a truth teller? Or do you find it all too easy to lie and to deceive? 
Are the words you use upbuilding to those around you, or do you use your tongue to tear them down? What are the sorts of things you say about yourself? How do you speak about you? Are you a braggart? Do you boast to others about your own achievements? Are you always talking about yourself and always talking yourself up? You see, our words are one powerful way that we can convey to others our decency or our indecency, our propriety or our impropriety. And this is so simple and so easy to do. Maybe after the service, you're standing around talking with a friend of yours, and you repeat a joke that you heard this week. And that joke could be clean as the driven snow and genuinely funny. And you could amuse your conversation partner. Or you could tell a joke that is off color or dirty, that has innuendo built into it, that would embarrass that other Christian. It's just so easy, so simple to say something that's inappropriate, to say something offensive, to say something disgraceful. Now, I know nothing at all about Representative Rashida Tlaib but she has created a strong negative impression in my mind as a foul mouthed disrespectful person who doesn't know her place in the political order of things. And it's all because of her word choice, and literally one word. And I would venture to say there's many people across this nation who would be in complete agreement with me that that single use of that single word has branded this person maybe a decent sort of person generally, but she's branded by her word choice as being foul-mouthed. So think about your words. Think about how you speak. Think about how you talk to others. Think about how you talk about others. A second area to consider is how you treat others. So we move from words to actions. Are you kind and gentle with others? Or do you have a perverse joy in pushing their buttons and watching them respond? Do you do things intended to intimidate them, to make them feel small? Do you sometimes point out and play up their weaknesses and their faults so as to embarrass them in front of others? When you know that they're in trouble, do you come to their assistance? Do you ignore them? Or do you pile on top? James says, If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. Here's the golden rule. Treat others the way you would like to be treated. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do you do that? Or do you find ways to make them miserable? just because you like to see them miserable. And so as much as we need to inventory our words, we also need to take stock of our relations and think about how we treat others. Are we treating them in a way that can be said to be decent, proper? After Dr. J. Gresham Machen died, the eulogies that came pouring in from around the world lauded him as a decent and respectable person 
And even from his fiercest critics and enemies, they had to admit this is a man who treats people fairly. And even when he disagrees with people, he treats them properly. That's character. That's the kind of love that does not act in an unbecoming way. So there is our words, there are our actions towards others. The final area I would just urge you to think about is the one that Dr. Kistemacher pointed out, your apparel and your appearance. How do you dress? How do you look? How do you present yourself? It all has an impact on those you meet, whether for good or for ill. I remember a seminary professor recounting an experience he had when he was the pastor of a church. And this was back in the 70s when he was a young pastor and it was kind of a a, a loose evangelical scene. And he said he realized that things were out of place when one Sunday morning the deacon taking the offering had a great big Snoopy on the front of his t-shirt. Now, would it be sinful for me to be standing up before you with a t-shirt with Snoopy on it? I don't think it's sinful. Would it be appropriate? No, (laughs) no, not at all. And, And he started to realize, you know, this isn't gross sin, but it's just not appropriate for the house of God. We're here in worship. This is not a ball game that we're going to. There's things that are appropriate at a ball game, but not so much in the worship of God. Now, I don't want to suggest to you that we're going to have the Grace Church dress code or anything like that. That's not the point. But have you ever stopped to think, what does my apparel convey to others? What does my appearance convey to others? And I think Dr. Kistemacher is right. Love extends to all aspects of our life, even to how we dress, how we appear, whether we comb our hair or not. And all of those things go into how we interact with others, which is really Paul's point here. Be appropriate. Do things that aren't shameful or disgraceful. Take the high road of propriety in all that you do so that you will be a great blessing and joy to those around you. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for Paul's challenging exhortation to us. And Lord, help us to think very hard about how we speak, how we treat others, and even how we appear and present ourselves. Lord, help us to be thoughtful of these things and help us to show the maturity of such love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.